Hey everyone, this is Zach Gerich of Agitation Rising. In this video, you'll see a debate that I had with conservative pundit Kevin Ferris of the YouTube channel Speechless with Kevin Ferris. I hope you enjoy this debate and leave your thoughts in the comments. Is America entering a civil war? Many I talk to believe it is. And so we need to actually sit down and have conversations with people we disagree with. On my channel, I oftentimes criticize things like the LGBTQ agenda, the alphabet people, uh, everything under the sun when it comes to socialism, communism, Marxism, and all that. But I oftentimes am asked, do you actually ever talk to anybody who thinks differently than you? Yes, I do. And now we're going to put it on record here on Speechless. Hey, 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 everybody. Welcome back to Speechless on Cities 92.9 and on YouTube. And that's where you guys are watching right now. Thank you so much. And don't forget to like this video, subscribe to the channel, comment what you think and share it with your friends, all that fun stuff. But let's get right on into it. I'm going to introduce my guest today. Zach Get Rich. Zach Get Rich, you are a leftist, a socialist, an alphabet person and more. Tell, introduce yourself to the audience. Well, ho, ho, ho. This is Zach Get Rich of Agitation Rising, your source for local leftist independent journalism in central Illinois and beyond. And I am here to engage in alphabet wars with you. Alphabet wars. <laughs> wars. Alphabet wars. Yes. Among other things that we will eventually discuss. But yeah. that's the main thing that we're starting with. Well, and your gay agenda is going to turn everyone who watches this today gay. It's going to be the Bud Light of YouTube. And that's the whole point. You can start off right with your shirt there. Yes. I mean, make sure the camera sees it well. If you're reading this, you're queer. Um, so everybody, uh, Pride Month is next July. Make sure you are out. It is July, right? That is, it the, is, that is, it is okay. July. Make sure I know I'm totally going to lose my gay card here because I got Pride Month wrong. But you want to know what? Not only are we going to take over the whole alphabet, we're going to take over the whole year too. So whatever. Make sure you're but out and you have your rainbows on, you put your dildos on and you wave them in everybody's faces, <laughs> especially the children. Um, because that's what... That's what it, it, it is to, to me. But we're going to talk about all of that under the sun in this long special, guys. Um, so let's let's just we're going to the whole point of this is that we can try to better understand and actually not necessarily change minds, but show that a civil conversation can happen between two people that are uh, at the surface level diametrically opposed. But I'm sure we can find some common ground in some things. So let's talk about we're going to for a lot of it, we're going to talk about. LGBTQ, but especially the gender ideology. And that's where I want to start off with is the gender ideology. The common question that's often asked is, what is a woman? I have my answer to you. What is a woman? What is a woman? I've heard this is hard, so I'm going to go slow. Okay, so a woman is an adult, an adult human, right? Am, am, I, am I right so far? I would say that a woman would be an adult human. Okay, good. I'm glad we got this. So it's an adult human with more female sex characteristics than male sex characteristics and or a female embodiment. Okay. Did, did so I get it right? More sex characteristics that are female. Yes. And a female embodiment. Yes. Female embodiment. Help explain that to me and my audience. Yeah. So an embodiment, it's it's you know, it's a term that's used in philosophy to basically describe the way that your body fits into space and time and interacts with the world around it and makes sense with the world. Um, and so it it kind of makes it kind of tries to get rid of this this nature nurture divide because in a lot of ways that that ends up being a false dichotomy. So you and I. We, you know, a male embodiment is an embodiment that we see typical of people with mainly male sex characteristics. And typically in our society, people with mainly me male sex characteristics, their embodiment attaches to typically masculine gender characteristics. But that's contingent. It's not inherently necessary. And there are plenty of situations that we find where that's not the case. And especially with gender, like sex you know, the way that sex is organized is fairly a common pattern throughout the planet. But the kind of gender traits and gender characteristics that exist are, you know, vastly different all across the planet, even now at our current time. Um, and so that that is, is does, does that give you kind of a, a brief a, understanding a better, of what embodiment a, a better means? better understanding. Uh, you bring up the term sex. Is there a difference between sex and gender? Yes. What is it? So, I don't believe, I don't really believe there is. 
I've, no, I've noticed. <laughs> so, like, sex is the way that organisms organize certain traits in order for in order to reproduce the species. Um, sex is not made up of any one specific traits. It's made up of a multitude of traits, and, and including genetic sex, chromosomal sex, hormonal sex, uh, gonadal sex, germ cells, gametes, uh, genitalia, and then you also have a number of secondary sex characteristics. And in order to actually reproduce the species, you can't rely on any one specific. They all basically have to be working together. The, it's a constellation. The stars have to align. And if they don't, if, if one of those characteristics doesn't exist sufficiently, then you can't reproduce the species in that sense. But just if something horrible were to happen to me and like I were to get castrated, I wouldn't cease being a male because I still have all these other male traits. So my view is not that there's like some essentialist quality that we have, like there's this essential notion of, of maleness that we all have. It's just that the reason you and I are males is because we pretty much almost all of our sex, especially all of our primary sex traits are male. And even if we lose one of them, the overwhelming majority of the rest of our traits are still male. And so that's what makes that's what would make us male. OK, so so that and that's sex. Yes, that's so, biological. Yeah. Sex. And that makes sense to me. You put you put the puzzle pieces together and it makes the full picture. Yes. And and they're all biological. It's all natural. Yes. I mean, there are people that will argue that there's certain levels of social construction involved in biological sex. But for the purposes of this argument, yes. OK, what about so then what is gender? So gender is the way that um, societies organize sexed bodies. So it's obviously they're related. Um, and it's basically you have what roles, what characteristics, what expressions, what ways of moving about, what things you're allowed to do that society says certain sex bodies are allowed to do and certain sex bodies are allowed to not do. And the reason that we say that it's socially constructed is because we see completely different forms of expressions and different roles all over the planet, you know, all over different times. So, and again, most of the time, the majority of the time, female bodies tend to, they're organized in a way to where they, their embodiment tends to attach itself to more feminine characteristics and vice versa for males and masculine. But we find all sorts of instances where that's not the case. And in the secular West, we've really opened up a lot of what we consider to be masculine activities and what we consider to be feminine activities and what we allow boys and men and girls and women to do um, compared to if we were to go to like really conservative countries like in the Middle East, where they still have very, very rigid um, understandings of what you know men and women are allowed to do. And I personally think it's a good thing that we've opened it up and that we've detached a lot of these qualities these qualities um or in some cases we've degendered certain things we've ungendered them and the idea that you, well, would you would you be able to describe it as the destruction of gender um there has definitely been a lot of that and that was a lot of what second wave feminism was attempting to do because throughout most of human history things like you know men are more intelligent women are more emotional men um you know, they are transcendent. Women are imminent and what they're the lack of men. Women are more stupid. All of these things were considered to be hard biological facts. They were considered to be necessary characteristics of being a woman or being a man. And especially when second wave feminism came out, and this had already been going on for about a hundred years, there was this, it's like, no, that's ridiculous. Women can be leaders too. Women can do all sorts of stuff that men can do. Um, and so it was really important to detach these away, but we still find it useful in society to have some of these expressions. And for whatever reason, you know, some of us enjoy these in ways that don't always make, um, that, that are contingent, that are, that are in some cases arbitrary to others. And so that's the difference basically between sex and gender. Sex is the biological traits that we use to reproduce the species and whether you're fertile or not, I mean, so to me, there is a, there is a, what I would call a spectral binary between the two sexes you have, because it's, it's different organizations. We have a pattern of male organizational traits and female organizational traits. And depending on how many traits you have is where you fall in line with that spectrum. But then 
you can also have another binary spectrum that gets put on, whether it's fertile and infertile. So depending on your organizational traits, you may be more fertile than other people, depending on their organizational traits. Um, and so I, that's, I would call it a binary spectrum when it comes to biological sex. Gender is something entirely, entirely different, whether it's a spectrum or a binary and stuff like that. So, yeah. so put it in gender, because I understand where you're coming with sex. Sex makes sense to me in your definitions. It's natural, biological. It's a puzzle. It's a puzzle where you can have some of the pieces missing, but the picture is still there. That makes sense to me. In your simplest terms, gender. I, I feel you covered it a little bit. Uh, socially constructed. Um, what do you think a social construct means? Let me just ask you that. A social construct would be something that's not natural. Well, not inherently natural. In terms, it's naturally occurring. Naturally occurring, but it's not. It's not like you were. It, it was born to happen necessarily it was something that the people of society made up in simplest terms okay but do you but do you assume that social constructs aren't real mm, depends on what the social construct well money be. is a social construct would you agree that money is a social money construct? is a social construct okay and it's real yeah it, it's money real. is exactly. real the value in it is what we place on it. yeah and that, that that's a real value yeah so social constructs are real things it's not like they're just these like fictions that we're pretending. Okay. So I, I, I much more agree. I kind of actually agree with that. That's yeah. why, that's why, and, and there is a, there can be a sense of naturality to the entire idea of a social construct construct. If we take gender as an example of it, if we consider ideas like, Oh, well, it's been a social, it's been a quote unquote social construct of gender for a lot of our life that women are homemakers. Women, women take care of the children, which, you would say is it would I, just to make sure you agree is a part of the idea of of gender and yeah that okay. is that is one way that organize that uh, societies have organized female bodies yep. and biologically it would also that would also make sense considering the fact that women naturally have tended to be more caring empathetic and everything along those lines than men have ever been so it would make more sense generally based on that natural inherent uh again well, by it, and large i speak by and large because we teach everybody that everybody has 10 fingers 10 toes you don't teach that you, then you talk about the exceptions to the rule but it's not it's not the the rule in and of itself yeah but what do you think that means exception to the rule like do you think the exception to the rule invalidates the exception what do you mean okay so i mean in this case we're, we're not so much talking about a rule but a pattern yeah the exception to to the to the pattern shows that a pattern exists but the exception also still exists. Otherwise, it wouldn't reveal that there's a pattern. The exception still exists, but when okay. but when you have a conversation about the the overall whole, you can't use the exception or the or the the one the small one percent or 05 percent, whatever it is, the the minuscule portion to invalidate the other ninety nine point nine percent. Well, you can if you believe that the ninety nine point nine percent is a necessary condition and necessary in the same way that two plus two always equals four. I I think we're getting a lot. It, we're getting very meta in a lot of this. Let's bring it so. back. Let's bring it back into. So, can a man become a woman? I want to. I want to try to deal in simple terms because so that everybody can understand the conversation we're having. Yes. Can a man become a woman? Yes, and a male can become a female. Like I also believe you can change your biological sex as well. How can you change your biological sex? Because you can change the sex traits that make up your biological sex. You can't change all of them, but you can change a lot of them. I heavily disagree. Okay. You can, can you can present, you can do everything you can to look and cosplay as the other gender, the other sex, can, but you can, can never you, fully become a become a woman. Can, can you or become a can, male? Can you can you remove sex traits? Like, can, can I, can I chop my dick off? Yeah. Yes. I can. So, chop you, my so dick you have off. one less trait. So your, your biological sex just changed. You're still, mo you're still male because you still have mostly male sex traits, but your you, the organization has changed. But that doesn't mean I've changed my, my sex. Yeah. You're still male, but because you have mostly bi like male sex traits, but say you start taking female hormone levels. And like, just to be clear, we all have testosterone, estrogen, and progesterone in our bodies, whether you're female, male, intersex, or whatever. Um, the actual difference is the amount of them. So if you started taking female levels of hormones, even though you have an XY karyotype, your body would still respond to them in the same way that somebody with an XX karyotype. That's why 
uh, people that start taking uh, female hormone levels start to develop breasts, their, their body structure can sometimes shift uh, and stuff like that. So like, yes, you, you can change. Like even you and I, our sex traits have already naturally changed. Like the idea that sex is immutable is, is just fundamentally absurd because the basic concept of something being biological is that it can change. That's like, that's like the essential feature of something being biological is that it can change on its own. But I feel like we're talking about two different things here because you're starting and saying that you can change your sex, that you can change it, but you're saying that ways in which you would do that is by chopping off my dick or you would change the morphology of your genitalia starting, or starting to take hormones, both yeah. of which would not be natural or biological or, or naturally biological. But your body would still respond but naturally go, but then to you go them. On, but then you go on to say that, that well, it's the entire idea of, of nature and biology that your that your body will change. Well, yeah, you're right. We go through puberty, but at the end of the day, going through puberty means that I I went from a young male to an older male in no way. And, and while and, it changed and, some and of my sex traits, did occur. It, it, it changed some of my sex traits. It, it traits and it in no way changed my sex. Yeah, because you still have just, most of those same traits. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so, so yeah, but but your organization changed. Like you gained. In fact, you gained more traits from going through puberty, unless you were able to inseminate at birth. Were you like a little Rizzler? Did you have, did you have that newborn Riz? <laughs> no, I was not. Okay. Well, I was I'm not just a, making sure, you I know, props not, to you if you got that, man. <laughs> that is not who I was. Uh, it's not. But again, like you you actually gained more sex traits when you went through puberty. So again, like you can, I mean, even when we, you know, when, there, there when we. There's a process of human development that, that, allow naturally that allows for many of your sex traits to become more predominant past puberty i'll agree with you there and so yes your 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 sex traits change naturally but it in no way changes your your biological sex and you have said that you can change your biological sex yeah. i don't believe that i don't understand how that how that works i, I mean you may you may be like you're still saying it's the same label which i completely agree mm -hmm. it's the same label but the it's a specific organization has changed. You've gained more traits, or you gain less traits, and this the, the thing that puts you in the pattern is just simply what type of traits that you have. So if you continue to get more male traits, you stay within the male pattern. But if you start changing those so that you start gaining female traits, then you move into a different pattern. I mean, the, we like we already have intersex people that have. And there's different ways of defining what it means to be intersex, but my definition is simply that you have incongruent sex traits. So you may have XY chromosomes, but because uh, you have a different, because of some genetic um, defect or genetic difference, you your body doesn't respond to testosterone. So you end up developing a completely female karyotype. And some people with androgen insensitive androgen insensitivity syndrome also end up being able to get pregnant and they have perfectly healthy babies. So if it's necessarily the case that only people with XX can give birth, then all I have to do is find one example to show that it's not necessary, that it's contingent. I mean, I'm not disagreeing that like in nine, in the high 90 cases, these are the patterns that you find, but I'm disagreeing that it's a hundred percent natural or necessary, or excuse me, I'm disagreeing that it's a hundred percent essential or necessary that it's the case. And, you know, if you are sterile, you get procedures done that would give you more, you know, if you're a female and you're sterile, you, there are certain procedures that you could get done to give you more female sex characteristics so that you could become fertile and vice versa for males. Okay. We're going, I, I feel like a lot of what you do when you talk, and this is just a, a not, not necessarily even criticism is you'll, you'll expand things out to a point where I, I'm not even following exactly where we are anymore. I want to get, I want to stay on to. Well, look, there's a reason why biology textbooks are thousands of pages of long and not five pages of long, because it's one of the most complicated things in the known universe. Like, I really don't. But, that, but, but, but the problem, eight... here's where, here's where I think a lot of times leftist progressives, I think they get, I think they get it wrong is that there are ways to, yes, you're right. You can have a 5,000 page biology textbook but you can have a conversation about it that doesn't necessarily need to be 5,000 pages long and you can and you can make it to where it's it's relatively simple. This is a point where I really wish I had screamed out complex natural facts don't care about your brain's 
feelings for simplicity. You can. I think you can make the majority of, of concepts into a relatively simple conversation. Yeah, you can abstract and generalize. It's, it's something that is essentially like humans are really good at doing it. Humans are really good at finding patterns. I'm not denying that patterns exist. I'm just trying to get into the minutia of the patterns. Now, in most of the conversations, is it necessary that you get into it? No, but in this specific one, I, I think it is. I think it's absolutely relevant. I think when someone says, you know, something like biological sex is immutable, I mean, that's just clearly false, regardless of whether you even include trans people, because again, as I've said, from birth throughout the life, your sex care, your, the organization of your sex traits is constantly changing. And it's not even in one direction towards more fertility, because as you get older, you get less fertile. So the idea that biological sex does not change is it just it's just fundamentally absurd it's, well, it's fundamentally unscientific the biological sex does no, not the label that we give it the word that we give to a specific set of patterns does not change that is correct but the biological sex so, so abs, you, the sex traits themselves which are what determine I'll, the biological sex absolutely change but again the biological sex does not change the traits can but the sex itself does not I mean, you could say it changes and it becomes more advanced or okay, it becomes less can, advanced. But again, that's a change. But then that's the traits. <laughs> We're talking about the traits. The sex itself did not. The sex is only the, constituted the puzzle, based the off of the traits. The puzzle still there. The puzzle still shows a comparable picture relative. And, and yes, maybe maybe it, it faded a little bit with time, but the picture is still there. Yeah, it's still so false. And you can't change it from being a guy to a girl in a dress. I mean, you can change your sex traits. You can, yeah. Well, you can change. You, you, can, in, 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 you like, can change your sex traits, but your sex did not change. Well, of course it did. No, it didn't. <laughs> no, of it course didn't. It See, did. here's, here's where, because you, a male cannot become a female. Not with that attitude. <laughs> you're right. You got to have you're a better. Right. You got to no, have a better no, attitude no. than that, man. <laughs> no, a male cannot become a female. A female cannot become a male. It does not matter how many hormones you take, how many dresses you wear. How many, well, a dress how, isn't a biological sex trait. Well, it's <laughs> it's not a biological sex. Like, there's nothing inherent in 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 like chromosomes that says, "Ah, I must wear a dress." <laughs> no, you I'm know, not, it's like I, I watch shows where like men's are wearing kilts. Those, those are essentially like kilts are essentially dresses, man. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is that it does not matter how many hormones you take if you cut off your genitals, if you add some, if you add some fake ones, some prosthetics, anything like that. You cannot change from being a biological male to being a biological female. Yes, you can. <laughs> because How, though? How? I, 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 I've explained that because the only way that sex exists is through all of the different traits you have. And you can change those. You can't change all of them. And it's not easy to change your sex traits, but you can change them. And but like, again, it, you're still, you're only changing some of the traits, not all of the traits, yeah. some of the traits. And so there's I mean, no way, there is zero way to change all of the traits. Yeah, no, I, I, at least as of we have now, I completely agree. And so, you know, if you're a trans male, I mean, I think it's perfectly fine just saying that you're an intersex male at that point. And I don't know if I've brought up intersex so far, but intersex just means you have incongruent sex traits. I mean, in my definition is it means you have incongruent sex traits that we do not normally find. Yeah, we don't normally... There's people that are born with both sets of genitalia. They have uh, there are chromosomes that don't necessarily match. There are then... there are people that are born with both XX XY chromosomes in different cells. Yeah, and, we're, and again, we're talking about like one percent, if not less, of the population. It's be, like, it's it it's between 002 percent and one point seven percent, depending on how you define intersex. And the way I define it would be closer to one point seven. I'm willing to bet if I knew exactly the definitions, mine would probably be closer to the point two percent. Well, again, because the point oh. Well, well, 0.2 is, is higher than oh, 0. 1. 0.02. Point, yeah. So like 0. 0.02, it's based on whether you have like ab abnormal genitalia. Me, like I said, I, I base it off of incongruent sex traits in general. So you could have one karyotype, you could have a male karyotype and all the rest of your traits but end up that, being wouldn't, female. Wouldn't that essentially mean that like you had, like you could have a dick, but you were born with, with the uh, genetic predisposition to grow maybe slightly larger a slightly larger chest. Yeah, there are. I mean, and having tits, ha having breasts is a secondary female sex characteristic. But I mean, like it could also just present itself as being a larger guy. It could also <laughs> present itself. I mean, there there are some men that you're are not going to be like, you're not going to, but be there like, are some men that are able to lactate. 
Like that is a real thing that happens. Yeah. So there's women that are able to grow facial. There's actually a lot of women that are able to grow facial I'm hair. Uh, <laughs> I mean, there are women that can go bald. These are all secondary sex traits. And so, yeah, I mean, they move but, around. So They're not a hundred percent. By your definition, all of those would be included in the intersex. No, intersex to me is only uh, incongruent primary sex traits. Okay. I, I wouldn't include secondary sex characteristics. Okay. And again, secondary sex characteristics, we don't even call them sex characteristics because they occur around or, puberty even though they don't have any direct relation to reproduction proper okay so okay um so there was a there's a question that we because we made a I'll, I'll let everybody know out there we made like a short notes page as a general guideline and uh we have a question here do trans people actually exist um we've kind of hovered around the issue of trans we've been talking a lot about more about biological sex um do trans people actually exist i'm pretty sure this one was much more uh aimed towards myself uh Yes, there are people out there that do believe that they are a different gender than they really are. Trans people do exist. Uh, however, all right, we end it. We, we figured it out. We're done. <laughs> Won the alphabet no, wars. I get this, but I, I get this question all the time, or not even necessarily the question. I get this accusation at me all the time. It's you're denying people's existence. Oh no 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 no! If a person comes up to me and it's obviously like I, I've done, I did a video recently on this biological male that goes into restaurants and just talks about how, or it just complains that he gets misgendered by all of the wait staff. No, if that person came up to me, I would absolutely know they exist. Uh, I could, I wouldn't, but I could touch them. I could, I could feel them all that. Uh, they do exist, but he, he is, he is in a state of delusion. He is in a state of delusion. He is not a woman. He, he is he has been put through a lot in his life uh, that has led him down a road to be significantly mentally ill. I mean, I think the reason some people might make that accusation is not because necessarily you have said trans people do not exist, but what I will very nicely term the gender critical movement. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what I will very nicely term the gender critical movement, there are many people like Matt Walsh and Michael Knowles that absolutely deny that trans people do exist in any form. But their argument will be very uh, much the same. <laughs> their argument will be very much the same. For like, So Matt Walsh's and Michael Knowles will be very... Do you have a continuing thought on that? Yeah, I mean, they will say it's a uh, a delusion. I don't believe it is. I mean, I believe that gender dysphoria, which many trans people have, and the way that kind of the medical community has has defined it is that gender dysphoria itself is the mental illness, but the treatment of it and transitioning is not itself the mental illness. And so th that's specifically different. And, you know, you can go on and on about... Well, you can start, I mean, you can start with gender dysphoria. You could also, I mean... Gender dysphoria has been reclassified by the DSM as no longer a mental illness. Uh, which, no, gender dysphoria is. Uh, it's, Ge it's transgenderism. Is gender a Having gender identity disorder, which means that you are transgender, has no longer been classified as a mental illness. But having ex extreme gender dysphoria is a mental illness gotcha. because it disrupts your ability to function normally in society. And that's typically how we define mental illnesses, is where, whether you're able to fully function in society or not. Well, how do you... I, I could go on a whole tangent about how do you define what is considered fully functional in society? Because I would argue a significant portion of my generation is not fully functional yeah. in society. Uh, and I can't speak for all you. Zoomers. <laughs> I don't have anything wrong with Zoom. I'm not like one of those guys. that's like all oh, these damn Zoomers and their Tide Pods and their rap music and their AIDS. I'm not one of it's those not guys. All that. It's just, I'm, I mean, I'm not one of those guys. It's, we have people crying about the fact that they have to work a nine to five. And I'm just like, okay, calm down, honey. Yeah. Um, but well, I mean, so like, I'll give you an, ex I'll give you an example. I mean, uh, I knew a trans guy. And when I met him, he was homeless. He was in with like people that um, frequently um, abused him and um, took advantage of him. He didn't have custody of his kids because he had had kids prior to realizing he was trans. Um, and then I met him and we started getting him on a regular hormone regime. He was on mental health meds. He got top surgery. He realized he didn't need to take his mental health meds anymore um, because he got rid of like that level of dysphoria. And he's continued to progress. And now he has a long-term partner. He has custody of all of his kids. He has a long-term job. He owns his own house. So clearly he went from being disordered to his life now being very well ordered, having pretty much the normal life. I mean, he's living his best life as far as I'm concerned. He's living a better life than I am. And I don't have gender dysphoria. So clearly 
going through that process made his life significantly better. Okay. And I, I will, we'll get, I want to, one thing I want to bring up though, is in terms of the idea of the mental illness before, because I, I want to talk about the idea of whether or not transitioning and everything like that, positive, negative effects, everything like that, as well as the argument between adults and children. But I want to start off with this thought I've had for quite a while. There's, there's another mental illness out there um, that is called psychosis. And psychosis in simplest terms is the belief in something that is not. Uh, there, that's, that's another way that I would classify any level of transgenderism, gender dysphoria, anything like that, because you are believing that you are something that you are not. And even from what, from what I understand from the conversation we had earlier, if there is somebody who is fully presenting as male and it was born a male and has all the sex traits as a male and they believe they are a woman, wouldn't that be a classification of psychosis or at least in some level of, of a delusion because you, you by, by your own accord in the fact that to even to change your sex, you have to change your sex traits. So somebody who has all the sex traits of a male, but they believe that they are a woman. Wouldn't that be a mental illness? Yeah. So there's different way that trans theories um, tend to try and answer this question. People, I don't want to say this is exclusive to trans medicalists, but people that are more of the exclusionary type of trans would say that the brain itself has sex is, is a sex organ. And so a lot of them will say, well, you know, if I'm a trans, if I were a trans man, they would say, I was born in a female body and I have mainly female sex characteristics. Um, but I have based on the phenotype, I, I have a male brain. And so that's where something like dysphoria happens. And so then it comes down to, I mean, how do you treat that? How do you fix that? Now I'm a little skeptical of like brain sex, whether there even are like dimorphism in the brain, as far as like morphology is concerned, the best thing that I've, kind of heard is that there's more of a mosaic in a similar way that I described earlier. There's lots of different, different, like males tend to have more of specific types of male brain traits. Females ha specifically have typically have more types of female brain tra traits, but typically when you're born, it's a mosaic. You, you have a mixture of both. You may have way more of one than the other, but it's a mosaic. And the way the brain works is it only works in relation to the world and the environment that you're in. Even, you know, at my age, you know, as a dinosaur at 35, um, your brain is constantly rewiring itself based on the environment that it's in. So your brain is constantly changing. And so, um, yeah, I mean, my belief is basically you're kind of born with a certain body schema and it's always a schema that's open. It's open to be able to be changed and it adapts with the situation. And for people that are trans, they are born with a body schema that for whatever reason rejects certain, tr certain sex traits that they have. And I'd go even further re reject certain types of movement, re reject certain types of ways of expressing. And it, it's a very small minority of people, but it still exists. I mean, the evidence is, is clear that, that these people exist. And the evidence is also clear that transitioning overwhelmingly has has beneficial effects for them. So well, I would disagree on that point. The, that it has overwhelming beneficial effects for them. The most comprehensive study that I, that I understand, uh, over 300 people over the course of almost 30 years in, out of Sweden, conducted from like 1973 to 2004. Um, I just know this one. I know we had a document. I just I, this is just one I've known for quite a while. Um, it's the one that says 90% of trans people's suicide goes up. It's well, n not 90. It's, it's that the rate of suicide for trans people does not change post-operation. It doesn't change or it goes up. It, it's, it, it's like 50 to 51. It's 50% before 51% after. Okay. Cause the one I'm familiar with, the one that's in what is a woman, it's called long, long-term follow-up of transsexual persons undergoing sex reassignment surgery cohort study in Sweden and it's by Cecilia Dejdene. I'm sorry if mm -hmm. I'm selling her name wrong. That's fine. And she has explicitly said in interviews, of course, trans medical and psychological care is efficacious. She has said multiple times that the study itself, this study I just quoted is being completely misrepresented by people who are gender critical. So even the person who wrote the study is saying, this is not I don't what really the study care. says. She says I, I care about the statistics that it points out. 
Yeah, but she's saying that that you're misinterpreting the statistics. That's what There's, she's saying. I'm reading the statistics like verbatim. Like I mean, I see like verbatim. It, it says that the suicide rate does not change pre to post op. Yeah, and, and the, now we can talk about why that would be. But, and the reason, but, and the reason that. She's, but how am I? How am I misinterpreting that when that's what it says? Like. Well, because she's saying that you are misinterpreting the data and the reason that... How is that a misinterpretation? That's like exactly what it says. But the reason that it says that is not because of the specific uh, sex reassignment, but it's more of uh, the way that society treats those people. That's why it doesn't go up. But how and do I we mean, know that? that? And that's that's where I want to... That's Because that, that's what she says in the study. But how does And she... so here's the other thing. Here's the other thing. Look, there's there's another study here so, but, says, but, well, but, hold, but on, wanna, hold on hold okay, on okay. what you. we know project from cornell university what does the scholarly research say about the effect of gender transition on transgender well-being and it says we conducted a systematic review of 55 different studies that can and what it found is that 91 93 percent found that gender transition improves the overall well-being of transgender people while only seven percent reported mixed or null foundings we found no studies concluding that gender transition causes overall harm and then if you look at detransition this is regret after ge gender affirmation surgery a systematic review and meta-analysis of prev prevalence by bustos et al from 2020 they went over 8,000 transgender patients who underwent any type of gender affirming surgery and the pooled prevalence of regret was 1%. So this, this is what the actual like data is showing on this issue. Okay. But what I want to, okay. So what I want to talk about with all of it though, is, is so the claim was that I'm misinterpreting it because it's because of how they're treated in society. My argument to that would be, are you mentally well? If you go through all of these changes and you need my validation, and you need my validation to keep you from committing suicide. I mean, if someone calls you like a piece of shit over and over again every single day, that's going to affect your mental health, right? I, I mean, <laughs> if, like, I if, went every, high school, if everybody's I went high doing it, with, I went through high school with that. And while it didn't have like the best, I, I came out of it and I made what it what it taught me was that wow, so many people's opinions about me do not matter. They do not matter. If you, if you firmly believe you're a woman, why do you need my, and because the thing is, I'm not calling them a piece of shit. And, and so anybody, yeah, no, I'm not saying and, that and you no, are, I know. And so I'm I just using that as an that. example. My, my, and I, and I understand that. And so sure, nobody should, but, but what I see at least, and again, it's not necessarily statistically backed, it's anecdotal, but from what I see, what, what is told as mistreating transgender people is when they are obviously a he and you call them a, and you call them or and you and you call them that when they identify and pretend to be a woman that's what's considered mistreating somebody who is transgender so this is something that i wish i had spoken up a little bit more about or talked in a little bit greater detail about cuz kevin's talking about this video a trans woman posted of um, her being at a restaurant recording herself and then various staff and personnel misgendering her like over and over again even though she had made it very clear that she wanted to be re referred to as she her pronouns very very odd to me uh that this is you can see right there times i've been misgendered and he films himself doing this we're going to talk about it let's take a look at some of of, of his videos in looks like uh, he's having a uh, nice piece she, all she, she her yeah. Yeah, it's okay it's all good but it was not all good hi I use she, her pronoun. It's the voiceover for me, but it was not all good. Okay. I'm not sir. Yeah, like it, it. it's like a knife in the heart. I also I did specifically ask ahead of time not to be called sir. It's like a knife in the heart, everybody. It's like a knife in the heart. Yeah, I'm just going to go. 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 And he's acting as if being misgendered by your pronouns is the singular thing that trans people are experiencing or just misgendering in general. Um, but you know, honestly, most of the trans people I know, yeah, I mean, they'd like it if you use the correct pronouns, but far more significant social impacts that negatively affect their life, including 
losing your job or not being able to get a job, losing your housing, being completely cut off from your family, being considered dangerous or, you know, that somehow you're going to harm somebody or you're going to harm children just because you're in their vicinity. Those are going to have far more of a negative impact on your life than, you know, just being uh, misgendered, somebody, somebody using the wrong pronouns. And if somebody was doing that to Kevin, it would probably significantly negatively impact his mental well-being too. So yeah, social validation is pretty important. We're social animals. That makes sense. It's not, not crazy to assume that social factors can influence your mental health. So that's the only other thing that I wish that I had added at this specific point in the conversation. And so if you need my validation of your delusion, then are you mentally well? Because here's the thing, for the most part, by and large, I'm like, if you are 19 and you get cleared by a cleared by a person that is or a medical professional, medical professionals, psychiatric professionals to go through a gender surgery, sure, okay. Though just to be clear, not all trans people ch- medically transition. Not all trans people choose to medically transition or they they don't feel that they always need to. OK, so, but the study that we were that. discussing talked about the effects of, yeah. of medically transition. of what That's I would, what of what I would consider transsexuals. So. Transsexuals are people who actually medically transition and all transsexuals are transgender. Not all transgender people are transsexuals. Squares and rectangles. But um <laughs> it's a smaller square within a rectangle. Okay, that's fine. I don't, I don't have a problem with that. <laughs> no, but my, 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 what, a lot of what I'm talking about here has to do with the those who do medically transition because that's what the statistic is from. We're talking about the efficacy of transitioning, uh, and so, or at least changing your body parts to be a better cosplayer, in my opinion. Um, but why, again, why is it? Is it do you do you not see a problem with the idea that if somebody because the the mistreatment that is being discussed okay sure if it's somebody continuously calling you a piece of shit now I I think I think nobody's mentally well if they're contemplating suicide um, and that's outside of transgenderism everything like that if you're contemplating suicide please seek help uh, no matter what it's for and it's awful that anybody kills themselves for any reason uh, in my opinion I mean there's the whole euthanasia argument that we could have but. Um, I don't, I don't particularly want, I didn't come here to have that. No, argument, I know. So. I'm, just, I'm just, I'm just covering all my bases. Um, but isn't there an issue when somebody needs everyone's and society's validation to prevent themselves from killing themselves? Isn't there an issue with that? I mean, it, it depends on what the specific problem is that it, that it's causing, but to act as if social factors have no influence on our mental wellness is again it's absurd i I think that's i think that's an utterly absurd statement it's like i don't think i ever said that it doesn't but but i I think that well i think you're minimizing it as if it doesn't i mean like i said i don't to me i don't think there is a hard nature nurture divide I, i don't think there is because your brain only works in relation to the world around you and in relation to the society around you and for some people you know if you have and insistent persistent and uh consistent gender dysphoria and it's very um extreme then yeah those those things could definitely have a significant influence on you and it seems like the simplest thing to do is you know call person the way that they want to be like if i just started calling you you know uh a she and i told you to like get off your rag and to smile more you might you might you might not take a you might not like that. Now, maybe you wouldn't get suicidal right away, but if I spent years and years doing that to you constantly and I was always around you, that might start to piss you off a little I, bit. I don't know. My sisters have called me <laughs> Kavina and the sister they always wanted uh, all oh, for, but, for my entire hey, life. Sounds like they're trying to tell you <laughs> something, Kev. Is there something they see in you that, that you don't realize yet? <laughs> no. It's are not... your sisters more open to trans no. people than you are? <laughs> Probably. <honestly. laughs> Come on. Do you just need a hug? <laughs> No, but but it's, that was that was obviously more joking. But and I understand where you're coming from. But I feel like in in this context, uh, it, when you're when you're discussing an idea that is more than it is more than understood in society that this is con- that it's controversial and that there are people out there very much like me that do not believe that you can change your gender. Now, some are in in moderate social settings. I can be respectful of people 
will still heavily disagree with whatever they believe, but I can be moderately respectful. And I think that people that, that are ardently like, like you're wrong and you're bet like, it's, it's just not like productive. It's not kind. It is, I, I believe in being kind by and large, but I feel like if you're going through something like this, you have to be able to understand that there are going to people be people out there. I look, I, and I, I mean, it's not necessarily a direct comparison, but I am well aware that a lot of people in my generation, a lot of people on college campuses are not friendly to conservatives that speak up and are honest and blunt about their opinions. I have been physically assaulted for my opinions. I have been verbally assaulted many times. I have had threats made against my life. This is something I knew when I came out as a conservative that, that, that I knew could happen. What was the point you realized that you were conservative? Was there like a specific moment in time? Um, not specifically. My parents were, I get this like questions like this. Uh, there, there's more of a specific moment in time when I realized I needed to speak when you out realize. more. When I realized I needed to speak okay. out more. Not when I realized I was conservative. It, that was kind of developed through, because uh, my parents were never politically active. It was uh, what I was told growing up, and, and I firmly believe, were lessons such as uh, hard work breeds determination, or hard work breeds success. Uh, you can do anything if you put your mind to it. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps mentality. Things like that. Can you that. actually, like, Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. I'm, is that is that I'm gonna possible? make a video of me doing it. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> I'll make a video of me. Be MLK cool. made a whole joke about this. Like, how are you supposed to do that? <laughs> I'm gonna do it. I'm okay. gonna do it. I'm gonna figure well, it out. Well, if you do it, then you know, props <laughs> to you. Maybe maybe I'll make Kev a... pulls himself up by his bootstraps. But Finally. that's but I was raised with that mentality. And then uh 2016 election came around and a lot of different opinions were being yelled at me by multiple people in like in high school. Uh, and so I started looking things up and determining where I fell. A lot of it was based on the economy, uh, and I wanted less taxes and I, and I grew a genuine general distrust of, uh, of the government. Uh, that was another value that was instilled in me growing up was the idea. It wasn't necessarily hating the government. It was more so, uh, no one is a better advocate for you than yourself. And so you should rely on yourself more than you rely on anybody else. And so I don't want the government doing everything for me, nor do I want it taking all my So money. you know yourself better than other people? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Uh, right. You're going to try to use that. <laughs> and, and so why don't, I mean, why don't transgender people know themselves better than you do? Well, if they genuinely do, then why do they need my validation? I mean, if, if, if I were Not to constantly, but, like, but you've just said that you've been made fun of for being, um, yeah. uh, conservative. And I don't need I, anybody's I, validation. I, I, I don't need them. I don't yes, need them but to I, be like, I would assume I would assume that in some cases that, that might have made you feel bad at certain points. So that might have given you anxiety at certain points. Yeah, until I broke okay. free from that. Okay. And like a because lot of I realized I put way too much value on what other people thought of me. Okay. I mean, in a, a lot of trans people, they'll just remove themselves from those types of spaces where that's going to happen. So, I mean, people have different ways of interacting with the world. I can't speak for everybody. Um, but I mean, again, to act as if like the the societies around you i mean look if you didn't have cities 92.9 if you didn't have turning points usa which mm -hmm. by the way you're a big turning points usa person yeah. do you think that you would have do you think you'd be more isolated more lonely if you didn't have these outlets here i think i would make my own nope. I, I think i think i think that's kind of just human nature when you when you believe or when you have a a cultural belief of some kind you will seek. Uh, it's it's honestly a natural tendency. But do you not think that this isn't, that that having this space here and and having other spaces where you and other like minded conservatives that that benefits your mental health? It makes. I mean, you go to these places because if you feel yes. better being in these places, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. All right. But I also but I also <laughs> do believe that it, that it benefits my mental health to challenge myself, and it's why my mind has been changed on a lot of different things in my life, and. And so I think I that, mean a lot of trans people have gone through immense challenges and, I'm not and, they, and they've been to able minimize that but and I, they've been able to and they've been able to but it, survive and, and go on. And so I mean the amount of type of pushback or you know anywhere from verbal threats or to even like physical threats, um, I mean that's gonna affect you over time, re regardless. And I, I think trans people in general and even a lot of alphabet people in general um, have faced some pretty harsh shit <laughs> in their lives. And everybody goes through hard. Well, I, that's, that's a, an 
<laughs> I mean, look, I haven't. The like, majority of people I know a have lot gone of, through something that's very difficult. Look, I know a lot of trans people that I will objectively say are stronger people than me. And that I that I am way more privileged growing up and had a way easier life than they did. And I don't think it needs to be a been, And they've been able to overcome. I know. I'm just acknowledging that yeah. I that I know trans people that are way stronger and they have been able to deal with society doesn't mean it, it doesn't feel shitty at times when when people like try and invalidate you or things like that doesn't mean that that never happens you just develop coping skills for it so okay i want to talk because i feel like we kind of hit a, a place on that one i want to talk about kids okay because that's where my biggest gripe is that's where the majority of society's biggest gripe is when it comes to a lot of the lg not even just the trans uh, stuff but we're i want to start with that and then move into the broader lgbtq stuff um a lot of people feel like one like well they know that there is a gay agenda um not necessarily trying to turn kids gay but get kids very very uh open and and recognize sexuality and very much in the transgender space as well there's advocates for uh for uh, gender changes at very young ages 10, 11, 12, 13 young children uh, that, and again, my biggest, my biggest gripe with that is the fact that we don't allow kids at that age to drive a car, own a gun, eat a peanut at school without their parent signing a permission slip. Why is it that people, are you, are you in support of allowing kids at young ages to go through gender transitions? Um, I don't have a problem with kids changing their gender traits or the way that they express it, like socially transitioning or, you know, like linguistically transitioning. I don't have a problem with that at, any, at pretty much any age because, yeah, I don't have that problem. If you're specifically talking about medically transitioning, um, I mean... Hormone therapy, surgeries, anything. Yeah, like that. so... Th That's I mean, more what the, I'm talking the, about. The, like. Yeah, so, I mean, so you don't have a problem with, with, with kids socially transitioning? Uh I have a, a personal gripe with it, but from a policy... What, what is your personal gripe? Well, because it? I believe that it's... I, I believe it's denying fundamental truth. I believe uh -huh. that... Do you uh, believe we're both masculine, that we're both pretty masculine right here? I believe we are both biological men. Okay, that's not the same thing that I'm talking about. I'm talking about differences between behavior and, like, specific traits. Sure, I, I okay. guess. It, uh, it, I, my, I, I think when it comes to the social transition, it's not my... It's not necessarily entirely uh, to to an extent not my place to tell parents how to parent their children to an extent again you wouldn't tell or you you, you got to intervene if a kid if a kid is getting abused you have to like like physically um, like hardcore emotionally um ob an objective abuse to telling a kid that they shouldn't wear a dress to school is not abuse now hitting that kid because they're where because they're wearing a dress to school that is abuse so uh uh, my point being with that is that there are levels of intervention that are necessary to prevent long-term harm. A parent should know what is going on in their kid's life. So when it comes to social transition, if a, if a parent is perfectly fine with their kid wearing a dress to school and it does not violate school dress codes or anything, and the parent is aware of that transition, then sure. I think it's I think it's weird. I think it's wrong. I wouldn't let my kids do it. Why wouldn't you let your why would why wouldn't you let your son wear a dress? Because I would think he is delusional for wearing a dress. For well, because if he is socially transitioning, he might not be. He might just say, "I like wearing dresses." Oh. That might that might just be the beginning and end of it. It's like, hey, I just like wearing dresses. They're well, fun I to wear. That even in and of itself contributes to the destruction of gender and sex. Uh, and so, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm against that. So. Um, but uh, sure, uh, but mainly it, it, when my question comes down to the irreversible damage that can be caused uh, from a medical transition at a very young age. What, are, what are, do you believe that, that is okay? Do you think there's an age at which you should be allowed to medically transition? Yeah, I mean, I would follow what is called the W path and W stands for World Professional Association for Transgender Health. I would follow their recommendations, which they don't, um, one is that in order to medically transition, the guidelines is that your dysphoria has to be insistent, consistent, and persistent. So you have to have extreme dysphoria. So not just because you occasionally like to cross dress or because you're occasionally effeminate, it has to be a very a severe thing that's impairing your life. The other thing is 
one of the requirements is that before any type of medical transition begins, according to the WPATH standards, is that you have to account for all other comorbidities. You have to see, are they bipolar? Do they have anxiety or depression that is independent from uh, your gender dysphoria? And so once you've gone through this, what's called a biopsychosocial analysis, and you've determined that perhaps their anxiety is directly being caused by the gender dysphoria, that is at the point where you would maybe begin having the discussions about medically transitioning. And what the WPATH recommends is that there's, there's obviously there's hormone blockers, which are technically called gonadotropin releasing hormone agonists. Um, and they recommend that anywhere from Tanner stage two to Tanner stage four. And Tanner stage two is basically the onset of puberty. And then if you're on that and you still continue to have persistent gender dysphoria, then as you get older, you would do cross-hormone therapy. Um, and the overwhelming majority, and, and I mean, I think there's some, I think there's kind of a sleight of hand that conservatives do because the world children, the word children in English has two different definitions. One is anybody who's under 18. And the second definition is anybody who is a prepubescent minor. And I would argue that there is a massive difference between a five-year-old child and a 15-year-old child as far uh, as I'll development. I'll agree with you there. But, okay. but again, the way that we, I mean, it, it gets more into a societal treatment. I mean, again, even at 15, you have to have a parent sign a permission slip to have a peanut at school. Mm -hmm. And so, so do you believe a 15-year-old should be allowed to medically transition? I mean, the, I, I would follow the WPATH standards, which usually requires so, that. So if somebody goes through the WPATH and goes through that stuff, then a 15-year-old should be allowed to medically transition. Yeah. It's part of, it's part of a, a, a clear medical project. To, and, and hormone replacement therapy has been shown to increase the well-being of teenagers' lives. I mean, do you think that... There are, there are several instances of which you have many that felt that, that, that have later come on to regret it. Yeah. And, and they, it, and they feel, and they, they've come out with stories about pressures from their doctor, how, how easy it was. They don't follow that W path. It, it was basically within the first, they had one appointment with their doctor. They never met with a psychiatrist or anything. They had one appointment with their doctor and they got hormone pills there. Yeah. And so is that wrong to you? Yeah. I, okay. I, I, if you're not following the W path standards, then yes, but, but, this is not specific to trans healthcare. This is, there are doctors that don't follow the proper procedures throughout medicine. That's endemic throughout medicine. You're right. So that's not as like, oh, well, we need to throw out like all transgender healthcare because some doctors are not doing it right. Cause we do have very specific standards that are very, I mean, I was just going over it like yesterday and it's just like pages and pages of different studies and going very, very, and it was very nuanced. And so I think that if you are going to be engaged in that type of therapy, then you should be following the standards as it is. Do I think that you should be able to walk in and necessarily um, be able to get hormone replacement therapy on your first visit? No, probably not. <laughs> but again, like I said, I would follow the WPATH standards. And so if a doctor isn't doing it, then that specific doctor is doing something wrong. But it doesn't say that the entire um, um, project of, of trans kids getting health care is somehow wrong. So we're on child transitions medically. Let's talk about, let's go to the entire LGBTQ movement as a whole uh, when it comes to children. Uh, there's been a lot of talk, uh, especially in things like, in, in places like Florida, around the discussion of sexuality among younger and younger children. Parents are obviously up in, many parents, not all, but many parents are up in arms about this. Uh, that, that bill was framed as the don't say gay bill, which within the bill itself, it didn't say anything. Yeah, about. it's called the Florida Parental Rights and Education Act. Yes. Uh, what are your thoughts on things like that? Um, I think the way that it's worded is um, very special because <laughs> it specifically says you're not allowed to talk about, um, at the time it said from, I think, kindergarten to third or fourth grade. Mm -hmm. But then it also included incredibly vague language like age appropriate. And it says you're not allowed to speak about sexual orientation or gender identity. But what it says further on down, and this is the part that I think a lot of people miss, is that any person can basically tell the school they need to, you know, if they have a specific issue with whatever, mm -hmm. that they can simply tell the school they don't like it. And if the school doesn't like it, or if the school doesn't agree with them on that, they can force the school to hire at the district's uh, cost a special magistrate 
to review the issue. And so you're going to end up in a situation where in order to avoid them having to pay the, the school, having to pay for stuff that's, that is unnecessary, they're just going to follow with whatever that one individual parent said. And I think a better approach would be essentially what happened. Was it with Hayworth was it last year? Yeah. So there was, and I don't know if you want to explain that because cities focused a lot more on what happened in Hayworth than, uh, than I did. Are you talking about the pornography in the library? Which one are you talking there, there about? There was, I think there was an eighth grade English teacher who had like a sex ed book in her personal library. Yes. Yeah, that's okay. pretty much, that's essentially, that's it, essentially you, you say sex ed, it had por pornographic material in it. Um, well, I mean, it's not like, like definitively pornographic, it, like naked bodies and everything. But that, yeah, I mean, it, it's not very good sex ed unless you're showing sexually explicit things. That's, that's not very good sex ed. If you well, don't actually like show also, also stuff. Also, also pushed gay, it, it talked about gay sex in it and, uh, and ways, gay, and ways, gay and ways, exists, for, yeah. and ways for pleasurable sex. To do you, me, to do me, you want I mean, to teach we, unpleasurable sex? Well, I think that I, <laughs> you want to teach people how to have bad sex. I mean, what? No, on, I, I, just, I don't believe that. I don't believe that sex ed needs to focus on on the pleasure side of it. I think it should simply be. But I mean, I thought my sex ed growing up was was great, uh, and it didn't really. In my my prior, my main sex ed was not in eighth grade. I think that was where the inappropriate, uh, a lot of the inappropriateness comes from. It. My like, I had in seventh grade, we had sex ed that was focused on uh that was focused on purely like the reproductive system I mean, and how that works grade? seventh grade okay. on the reproductive system period um and that was that and how that worked that was the first time that we had both genders in the same classroom it started off in, in fifth grade we talked about puberty um separate rooms for uh the sexes mm -hmm. and then seventh grade was purely reproductive and then like sophomore year of high school we had our sex ed health class and that was uh where it got a little bit more into the weeds and the details about um how uh, how sex occurs the effects it can have on the body uh stds um the and it, it, how to uh contraception was is that's the word i was looking for contraception um but they also did say every single time when we talked about contraception which i did like was that yes condoms work this amount of time the pill works this amount of time other things works this amount of time but abstinence still is the 100% most effective way to avoid stds and pregnancy um, it, it, are you aware of any sex ed program that isn't saying that? Well, a lot, oftentimes people want to, like, whenever you bring up abstinence period, they're like, well, that's not realistic. And that's not, that's, not, like, we, we, we should not be teaching abstinence. We should not be teaching abstinence. And I think it's, it should be always made 100% clear. And I have not been in every single health classroom in the country, okay. but I, I guarantee you that there are others that did not take as strong of an approach as mine, uh, that, that stress how abstinence is the best way to prevent all of the issues that can that can arise due to sexual activity i mean the, the only time that i've heard that specific argument made is when people are trying to say we need abstinence only education as a way to argue that we should only have abstinence even in like so i mean i went to schools back when i was a, a lad in the 2000s um i had segregated sex ed for i don't know a couple days in fifth grade joint sex ed in eighth grade and then it was part of it was basically usually you took freshman year health class and then it was part of that and like abstinence was included in it mm -hmm. but i think the reality is is that this this may actually be an essential quality of teenagers they will find ways to do things their parents do not want them to do and so only teaching them abstinence is is typically very ineffective at preventing teen pregnancies and sex ed, but I, I, I'm not aware of any not, sex ed not, program I'm not, I'm not, that has said that. I'm not abstinence only. I just want to be clear that I think that that should be a part of it. But again, nowhere in there was it, what it we talked about sensitivities of the genitals and stuff uh, in, in my sophomore year health class. Again, sophomore year, you're in high school. Um, and but we didn't but we never got into like, here are the positions you should have for good sex, which was things that were included in that Hayworth eighth grade book. Yeah, I mean, we, I don't, we I, never talked about anything. I, like it, was, I, I, it was never about it was never about sexuality. It was like sexuality in terms of like you didn't oh, well, you didn't you know, know about gay people at all. They didn't talk about gay people at all. We didn't talk about gay sex. We didn't we didn't talk about no. It was not about it was not about they, it, was not, they, it wasn't even purely about heterosexual sex. Did, did they ever thing. mention oral sex or anal sex? We discussed that. Okay, but not from a sexuality point of view. We didn't talk about the pleasures of it or anything. It was never okay. about. Um, 
it was it was very much based on the here are here's what can happen if you do these things. I, I think that a lot of it, honestly, I think a lot of it kind of went with the uh, predication that by 16, 15, 16, most young adults know that there are pleasures that can come along with sex and that is not for the school to teach. I mean, in typically in, you know, in, in, in sex, that it's, it's best to learn about sex and healthy relationships and stuff like the dangers of porn before you encounter them in the real world. Waiting until people have already found them is not always going to be the most effective way uh, at actually properly educating people. And so I don't have a problem with, you know, basically the way that you and I had it, where we started that sex for those beginning sex education talks in fifth grade. Um, I'm not aware. I mean, I'm not, I don't hang out at schools. That would be a really bad look for <laughs> me. Really, it'd be really weird. People like would really be like, Zach, like, what are you doing? No, I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't do that. So I, I, I don't know if, I don't, I, it's, to my understanding, it isn't being taught. I mean, look, I used to volunteer for Planned Parenthood for a long time. One of the projects that I worked on was getting comprehensive sex ed passed in Illinois back in the early 20 teens or the late 2000s. So I am somewhat familiar. And at that time, it was basically making making sure that all schools did comprehensive sex education from it was either fifth or sixth grade through 12th. And so so that's specifically what what it was uh, focusing on. I don't have a problem being like, you know, if you do this, it, it's greater chance that it's going to be painful. I like I like I don't have a problem like teaching people how to enjoy their bodies or, or stuff like that in an educational setting. I think that you can do there's plenty of like sex education platforms all across the internet that are not like that 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 are just they're doing exactly that. They're saying, look, this is the the best way that you can if you do choose to have sex and you do choose to hopefully have safe sex. That these are the best ways that you can actually. I don't want to teach people how to have bad sex. I don't want to teach people how to have painful sex. Like that doesn't make any sense to me okay. whatsoever. I understand where you're coming from with that. <laughs> I'm. I. I just don't believe it's our. Our one. I don't trust teachers enough. Uh, to to get into any of that. Nor do I believe it's necessarily the school system's job to get into all of the nitty gritty regarding that. I. I do think that parents should be having conversations with their kids about things like that. But the evidence and, shows that in general, they're not always okay, well, doing then that's that. A, that then and that, then that's a parental flaw. But then, but then here's the other thing. From, but I believe from that, an that, educational that, standpoint, kids tend to learn more, not only when it's not their parents telling them, but also when it's not their teachers. So oftentimes schools will bring in experts and that tends to be better for the kids because, you know, they have existing relationships with their teachers. It, it, it's better to get it from someone that they don't have um, um, you know, these like kind of long-term personal relations because they feel that they can, you know, more openly ask those questions and stuff like that. So again, that's what the kind of data has shown. And since like the, your, your generation, as I call them Zoomers, um, they're not all though. They're not all Gen Z. They're, well, they're, they're Gen Z, but they're not all boomer mentality. I'm not even. Well, I don't boomer. think a Zoomer is a boomer mentality. Well, it's, anyway, that's where it comes from though. It's Gen Z boomer. That's <laughs> or the like, fact that you all had to use Zoom for a long time. <laughs> oh, okay. I get that. I get okay, that. There, that makes there, more there's sense. There's a, there's a way. I just, anyway, but like we found that with your generation, teenagers are on average waiting longer to have sex and they're having less sex and that is one, those are not the statistics i've seen well then we're, we're seeing different things but and and that is because of comprehensive sex education and even more so because of lots of information that's available on the internet so like i don't have a problem with kind of the way what the, about k the, through k through four essentially because that's what, what the parental rights and and again that's when people want to talk about sex that's when that's when there've been accolades of, uh, of teachers that discuss homosexuality and sexuality period with young children. Do you think teaching kids about good touch and bad touch is a form of sex ed? Depends on how it's done. I mean, I remember in third grade being like, you know, if someone touches you, like the, de describing the difference between private places and, and, um, you know, uh, like private places and, and whether that's okay and, and not okay. I remember having that. It's like, it's not okay. If someone touches you in this area, it's not your fault. You should reach out to an adult, etc. Like I consider that an early form of sex ed. 
I don't necessarily consider it an early form of sex. But it's about your sex parts, and it's about potential sexual abuse. So like, that's... I, it was, I mean, if, if, because it's if not your difference just is just that, though, semantics... Cause it also, cause it, well, no, because it can, also, it can also relate to just the idea of assault period and battery period. Like, it, it's yeah, just... But I it's, remember it's, having... It's more about personal space. It's, but it's I remember just, having a specific... interaction. That's interaction education. I mean, but I period. remember having... Spe- maybe, I don't know if you did or not. I remember in primary school, I think it was third grade, having, you know, one day having a specific conversation about being... Uh, uh, not allowing people to touch you in, in not, your private areas. That's to not me, what that's I'm talking a, about. That's not what I'm asking about. What I'm asking about is genuine sexuality. Like you will have, you will have teachers of elementary school students that will get into pride, homosexuality, and 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 all of the and many ideas of sexuality. Young do, children exposed to books that do have pornographic images in them. Do, do you think there's a distinction between sexual relationships and romantic relationships? Yes. Okay. Do you think that it's okay to teach uh, elementary school students that um, homo romantic relationships are there's nothing inherently wrong with them? You shouldn't bully people because of it, and that it, that it's okay. I see. The there's nothing inherently wrong with it is the only one that I I I don't remember the preface of the question. I just remember the. I mean, look, that's, that's do what I think that's because because I don't I don't necessarily believe that there is nothing inherently wrong with a homosexual relationship. And that's where it becomes a problem for me, because if we're not going to be also teaching the Bible in schools, or at least at at age appropriate levels, then because within the Bible, there is something inherently wrong with a homosexual relationship. I mean, I do agree. I do agree. I do agree. Well, but, but, but (laughs) if we're going to talk about the idea that kids should be exposed to different ideas, then shouldn't they also be exposed to the idea that, hey, maybe there is something wrong with it? And because there's parents that believe that. And again, I believe that parents should be leading a lot of these discussions. I don't believe in. And again, if they're not, that's a parental fault. There, but but it, is not that, always the, it is not always the job of the school to make up for parent, where parents There's fail. parents that also believe in creationism. I don't think we should be teaching that in school either. So, I mean, look, I don't, I don't care if, you know. I, but I do, I don't I, care I do if, want to be clear, I don't though. care if somebody's magic book or whatever says that homosexuality is wrong. Because I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with homosexuality. Just because um, something is not the norm does not inherently mean that it is morally wrong. Like it's I, not, I, I, I don't know. I mean, Leviticus 1822 says, I, I, again, I, I don't care what the Bible, that's never <laughs> okay, going to be a convincing argument. But, to my, me. <laughs> but I know I'm not, try, but the, the argument I'm trying to make is that because people hold different beliefs on that issue, along with the fact that teaching sexuality, teaching any level of sexuality at that very level at that very young age. And again, sexual, the way you are expressing your sexuality, there's no reason why a young child should be exposed to, Oh, like you, you might want to be attracted to a boy. There's no reason that you you need to be talking about that. A teacher needs to be having that conversation with young children. I uh, mean, if if elementary school students already know enough to make fun of a person with gay parents, then maybe that conversation they already know enough that that's occurring. That that there are homo romantic relationships that occur. If they already know at that early age to make fun of it, then yeah, I think to make somebody make fun of someone because they have gay then parents the, or then, something. Then focus the conversation on anti bullying. Okay, but I mean, again, again, that's, that's, that's all, that's all I'm talking about. about that, I mean, that's that's all I'm talking about. You is, don't. Is, you uh, can you can you can tell somebody that it is not okay to make fun of somebody because of who their parents are, who they are, things like that. Okay, but again, there are classrooms in this country. That include sexually explicit material at K through five. Would you be, or K through three, K through four, because five, obviously we have the puberty talk, but at that very young age, is that wrong? Yes or no? Uh, Maybe the specific things that you're talking about that I'm not familiar, it might be. I mean, do you- Sexually explicit material. Okay. Do you think that we should teach elementary school students and we could sex segregate it if, if, if they want the accurate names for all their external body parts? No, I don't think there's a necessity for that. Okay, because because here's the problem is that you know oftentimes families they will make you know nicknames or code names for private areas, and and I've heard this story. I mean, it may just be anecdotal, but I've heard it multiple times about a kindergarten girl who kept telling her kindergarten teacher, "My uncle is my uncle eats my cookie," 
And she kept saying, and you know, initially the teacher's just like, oh, okay. And then she keeps saying, it's like, what is this? Who is this guy? The cookie monster? What is going on? Why is she always eating this guy's cookie? And then she finally asked the parents during a parent teacher conference saying, why does she keep saying that? Turns out cookie was a name, was a nickname that they gave for a private area. And so if that child had known the medically accurate name for that external body part, that teacher could have prevented abuse from occurring. Oh, it sounds that, like that, that, I mean, this see, is if, this if, is if the a, whole if a child reason. Came up and said something like, that sounds that, to me. It sounds like that teacher's dumb because I would have like I if I feel like I would have I feel like I would have <laughs> asked the question of. Well, what is that? Like, what do you mean you're cookie? Man, I, I, what, like, why I, are you I, telling I, me that? What do you mean you're cookie? And I then they like... probably would have made a motion to the area of where, like, I feel like it's, that's, to me, that story sounds, and I, I'm not necessarily saying you're a liar or anything. That story sounds super, I'm just saying, I, I'm I'm not saying, saying that, like that, that type happen, of thing is very sounds, common because, the, like... because the accurate names are not given. That's, that's what I'm saying is that giving as accurate information as possible is actually a preventative measure. It prevents abuse from occurring. So I don't have a problem if at a young age you just give all you do is just to give the medically accurate names for all your external body parts. I don't care if you sex segregate, that's fine. But like actually give them the medically accurate names. I think that will actually prevent abuse from occurring. Okay, but again, so, there, there are in, okay, so you gave a, a, an anecdote there. There there's a, a school, I'll give an anecdote, a hypothetical, because again, to me that at best that was a hypothetical as well. So there's a there's a classroom. And a teacher has a book on the shelf that includes sexually explicit material open for all the first graders to see. When I say sex, sexually explicit, it has pictures of, of a man going down on a woman, a woman going with a woman, man going with a man, fully nude. Is that wrong in a first grade class? I, I would probably not want... I, I probably would say that that shouldn't be in that specific classroom. Okay. And so, it, but if there's books in your classroom that you don't want, go to your school board, tell the school board and that school board can democratically decide. That's why I think like, even though I disagreed with the Hayworth decision where they, where they ended up firing that teacher who had this sex education book in her eighth grade personal library, at least that went through an act like the actual democratic process, as opposed to the way that the laws are constructed in Florida, where one person can force the school district to pay money to to investigate stuff, and then it, it ends up not being a democratic decision. There could have been the majority of parents in that district that didn't have a problem with some specific book or some specific thing, but instead of actually allowing the democratic process to go, I, that's what I see occurring with the um, Parental Responsibility Act in Florida, and I and I, I think that's a problem because I think you're actually undermining democracy. There may be plenty of parents that are like, no, I don't have a big deal with that. Let let let, let that happen. Okay. So, I understand where you're coming from that. I, I think we found some common ground in there. Well, one last thing, one last thing. Do okay. you think that that in K through four, that the concept of consent should be talking? I'm not talking about sexual consent, merely the concept of consent to hug someone, consent to hold someone's hand, consent to uh, play with somebody. Do you, do you think that that is something that should be taught at a very early age? I mean, yeah, but it's not, again, it's not in any way sexual. It's not, it's, it's, it's more about teaching personal space. Yeah. Uh, personal. But later on having that foundation yeah, can I mean, help with sex education. I mean, you're, you're taught, you're taught when you're in first grade not to hit people. Yeah. Like in, but a, I mean, in a way that's a form of, consent. yeah, but again, like, I like, I mean a very clear delineation of like even saying the word consent of, of very clearly teaching out these, these concepts. And I'm not talking about in a sexual nature, but I think that that is a form that could attend, uh, potentially be a form of proto sex education that that can occur in k through fourth grade yeah and i think but i, but I mean but I, I think by and large the people that are on my side and correct me if i'm wrong in the comments yes, but please do the people the people on my side they one we don't really see that as, as sex education but that's also not what people are angry about people are angry about uh sexuality like about the vastness of sexuality homosexuality polygamy how to even even certain levels of, of heterosexuality being discussed in classrooms. And they might be extreme examples, but they are happening. And so nobody is, nobody is for, for what I understand, if you are, I'd love to have you on my show to talk about it because I'd likely argue with you, but nobody is up in arms about saying, Johnny, you have to ask to hug Susie. Like yeah. nobody, nobody is mad about that. Okay, but that, but I mean, that's what I believe some of the education that's occurring at that level is. But under that Florida bill, if you say that it's okay for two, um, you know, 
two men to be married or two women to be in a relationship, and you don't mention anything about sex, one parent could possibly make a claim and th that could be ex excused. That, that could be prohibited from being said because, you know, you might be willing to make a distinction between romantic and sexual. A lot of people aren't. A lot of people freak out because, oh, mm -hmm. in the this Disney show at the very last episode, it showed two women that live together married. And then they automatically assume that that is somehow implying sexual sexuality when it's just replying romance so there are people on your side that absolutely think that even even anything romantic somehow implies sexuality i think i think it, it does have a level of implication I then mean, what's the difference between showing that you know men and women are in relationships is it just because that's the norm I, i'm like like men and women are in romantic relationships we learn that very very young that men and women it's very common for men and women to be in romantic relationships because well for well one that's that's the natural state yeah it's 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 the norm uh, yeah well it's the natural state and the fact that there there is there is no there is no biological well there's no biological benefit other than pleasure to be in a homosexual relationship i mean yeah in, in even in a romantic relationship there's pleasure involved i enjoy being around well absolutely person. but there are other benefits to a heterosexual relationship that are not included in a yeah, but there's lots of there's lots of hetero romantic relationships that have no they, they don't they don't want to have kids. It has nothing to do with that. And I look down so, on that yeah. just as much. <laughs> I mean, okay, I am for freedom here, and Kevin no, looks I'm down for, on freedom. No, 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 no. That's that what he just what said. I'm, I'm not saying that you can't necessarily <laughs> choose to do that. I'm just saying that I think that that, that gets that's that's not a policy discussion. I'm not saying you should say, oh, man, if you're going to be in, if you're going to be married, you have to have children. I'm just saying that I, I'm just like, I think you're wasting your time. Do you do you think homosexuality is a sin? Yes, I do believe homosexuality is a sin. But I also believe a lot of things that I do are a sin. I want to be clear there, too. I, I can drink too much. I've heard about I've, them. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I can drink. I'm too not much. trying to out you. I've <laughs> lusted after people. I am a sinner. I do believe homosexuality is a sin. My problem is not that is not necessarily with the sin itself. It's that we exalt the sin as if it's like I don't. I am not proud of of my lust. I'm not proud of my lust. The entire idea of the of the of the LGBTQ movement is called pride. So they're they're engaging in pride of their sin, and again, that gets into a a, 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 a do, biblical argument. Do you think that homosexuals that don't repent are going to hell? Yes. Okay. I believe that if I don't repent for the sins that I do, I will also be damned to hell. So well, I hope you do repent. Do you go to confession? I do. Okay, good. I do. So okay. I, I, otherwise, I'd worry about your eternal soul, man. Thank. <laughs> I know you. Would. I would. Yeah. You would. My grandfather's Catholic. Aren't my grandma atheist? and my I am, but you're I still but I worry about I don't worry about my eternal soul. <laughs> I worry about your eternal soul. What if we're okay? all right? I know this huh? is like getting on a tangent here, but what, what if we're all right? Like I've always thought about this. Like, what if whatever you believe in is what is right? <laughs> if, if, we're, if everybody is right. So like I get to go to heaven, but you just have nothingness for the rest of your life. You know, you know, then all I mean that seems to be the most likely outcome is that there's just nothingness <laughs> afterwards. So I don't see a lot of evidence for heaven, but like so we're all oh, right. Well. All the I mean, the but like, like terrorists, that, they get all the like, but like, virgins, but like that's like, I mean, <laughs> I wouldn't mind getting 72. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have, they don't have to be virgins, just like 72 people that like you know can have fun oh, for all God. eternity. I don't have a problem with that. Oh, I mean, as long as they're all adults and we're all consenting, that's fine. I don't have a problem with that, and if if that's what heaven has in store for us, so uh, Hamas doesn't really care if they're consenting. So, um, but <laughs> no, but I've but I mean that's also the that. thing about pride is that pride is, is pride is specifically a political movement, and it's a political movement saying that we there's nothing inherently wrong with us engaging in non normative consensual sexual or romantic relationships and we shouldn't be discriminated against for that 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 is what the movement of pride is do you understand why people don't take it seriously yeah because some people think that it's a sin and that you're gonna go to well, but that's not the only reason i mean like <laughs> hey hey if there but was the, a, but that's the foundation i mean was... your religion is the found is the foundational principle it's, it's an unconscious principle that guides everything that you believe in right in part but but the other uh, here's let's just take it to a very like face value <laughs> level if there was a if there was a group of heterosexual people that had their own pride type organization that went around preaching that we engage in weird crap sexually heterosexual weird, but only weird, heterosexually weird and they were you. walking around weird and they, to you well, okay 
by uh, I say by and large a lot, but overwhelmingly society would deem it as as unorthodox. Uh, if you want to have a state pride parade, go ahead and do it. No, no, no. But I mean, like they're but they're but in their parade and in their celebration, they're walking around fully naked, but, or with like dildos strapped to their chests and everything. I wouldn't take them seriously either. That's why That's I'm fine if you don't want to take them, take them seriously. But the one thing that we've learned in this country is if you ever want to get things done, you have to bitch and complain about it to the point where if people get so annoyed, they're like, fine, do it, whatever. I mean, that's been the history of movements in this but, country mm, since the founding. <laughs> yes, but there's a difference between, there's a bit different it's a difference between bitching and moaning and just being obscene for the sake of being obscene. I mean, the, I because, mean, because you want to know, you want to know who by, by your standards bitched and moaned long enough until it was fine. Like people who marched on Washington for black civil rights, which yeah. for the most part were dressed very, very professionally looked very good. were very cared about how they presented themselves in public. Even the, the forefathers of the pride movement, like Harvey Mil milk, we're not preaching to walk around with dildos strapped to your chest and shake your ass in front of little children on the streets of Chicago. And, so, and like, the overwhelming majority of the people in the country opposed the 1963 March on Civil Rights. Like the overwhelming majority of people did not like MLK Jr., regardless of what he dressed like at that time. Now we lionize MLK Jr. At the time that in the 60s and the, that he was alive, polls show that most people did not like him. So, I mean, you know, you can dress however you want in, in that specific instance. I don't know if that's always going to have uh, as I'm, big I'm of an effect believe, as I'm, it is. I will take somebody more seriously if they present themselves in a professional manner. Not to mention mm -hmm. the fact that, again, it is public obscenity. Like, if I was if I was caught outside taking a whiz in central Illinois, so my dick is out. I could get in. I could get arrested for public nudity. If you're, if, if you're, in, there are people if, if you're, parades if, that are. If, if you're in an alleyway, I don't think that you should get arrested for public nudity. If you're in an alleyway and you just go to could, the bathroom real quick, and I think that's wrong. And you could, you could also be put on like the sex offenders list, which I also think is I, wrong, I, I just because agree. you're trying to go to the bathroom. I, I actually so. know people that are on a sex offender list because they were taking a whiz in an alley. But I know people that were that are in that same <laughs> that are that are, have been in that situation. But my point is, is what about what? In the pride movement, do you believe that people should be out on the streets, buck naked, waving everything around with children present as well? I mean, I believe that in society, we already allow certain forms of nudity in certain specific places. We have nudist beaches. We have nudist colonies. Um, and I, I see pride events as very similar. It's like at this specific type of event. There might might be, I mean, I per I mean, I've been to some of these big pride parades. I haven't seen like mm -hmm. to me, like the nudity that is most is when like your genitals are actually showing. I don't care if people are walking around topless. I don't care if women are walking around topless. I think they should be able to walk around topless because, you know, hashtag feminism. But <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I haven't personally seen, you know, they might be in very skimpy clothing, but again, I don't, you know, this might be a difference between you and I. I don't I don't see the body as inherently sinful, or if there's anything like explicitly wrong about the human body do you think it'd be so, a, well but do you think that there it, do you do you could you understand the reasoning why people would not want children at attendance in attendance at these events yeah go, don't take your kids there then it, it, it's really that simple just don't like I, i'm would not you, i'm not going to force you to take your kids there why if, know, if you have your future that. children sometime I, I, in the I future i know that but do you so then shouldn't they be because there have been many that are advertised as as fun for the whole family yeah it, 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 again i don't see anything in like again we have nudist colonies where whole families go and it has nothing to do with anything like specifically sexual at those news. They just like, they just like to be nude. I don't, I mean, I, again, I don't see anything inherently wrong with the human body. Where do you derive so, your morals from? Do you have them? Do I have, do morals? have morals? Yes, I have morals. Are you actually? This is why I, it's a genuine question. Um, I, I mean, yes, yes. I, are, are you, are you, are you asking if I have like, if, if I believe in certain, like natural made morals or like God, like an objective morals. Kind of. Yeah. Kind of. That's kind of, I'm, I'm also, I'm just wondering like, where is your book? Like, like, like obviously not necessarily. It's kind of a, that's, it's not the exact way I want to word it, but like, what is your, like, what code do you follow in your life and why do you follow that? I mean, I, I base my morals on basically the, the habits and, 
um, that we learn from society, and I especially base them on certain ways of being free. So the habits I mean, we I, learn from society. So yeah, and I mean, the I, significant I, portion of our morals in our society are fundamentally a lot of them, not all, but it, the some very very basic levels of them are, are fundamentally Judeo Christian. Yeah, I mean, in Western society, I mean, and that's the society you grew up in. Well, I mean, we have a very secular interpretation in the West of a lot of those. So, but I mean, it used to be moral to, you know, beat and or, you know, sexually assault your wife. So, I I mean, I don't agree with that. Um, There are all sorts of things that in tradition that I I don't agree with. I'm going with the very basic level, like, thou shall not kill, thou shall not. Uh, well, that's that's like, but like our that shall not unjustifiably like there are justified reasons that you can kill somebody if somebody's attacking you you have the right to defend yourself yeah but, and that's what that commandment specifically I, means I, so. I under, but that, but that's what i mean it's not even just in the commandment sense just like the idea of like that's those are, are a lot of our fundamental morals like you will you, you're not gonna violate somebody else's personal space in terms of crimes such as rape assault battery anything like that yeah, um, I agree with all so, that. So, yeah, we shouldn't do but that. Those are all fun. Those those all were derived from, and the reason why they are enshrined into law are because of the Bible. No, they the, weren't. The they Torah weren't. The they, they weren't enshrined because of the Bible. They were enshrined because they make societal sense. I mean, it's not as if societies prior to the Bible ever being written didn't have these rules. Mm. I mean, that, that's kind of. Silly. I think that's silly. But so, I mean. It, actually societies before the bible before the bible existed many of them didn't some of them didn't i mean if, if they didn't, didn't have, have those if rules they, if, if they it didn't was, it was influ- a lot of that was influenced by judeo christian uh, ideology well i mean so so what there, i'm trying to say here plenty, is, that, I mean, is that a sense of your morality is, stems from judeo christian ideology I'm, i i i mean i i believe that there are plenty of societies that have existed that had no connection with judeo christianity that did in fact outlaw murder and assault and rape and stuff like that so i i guess i just disagree with the premise i i agree with all those things for whatever reason based on how you know the way that these types of things unconsciously build up uh into you over time and morality is itself kind of uh a social construction for whatever reason, you know, hearing about somebody just indiscriminately murders somebody, it gives me a visceral feeling against that. And so that's why, why I'm against, I don't know. I, mean, I don't, I don't think there's going to, there's ever going to be a clear explanation for some of the things of why specifically that attaches itself to me that gives me a visceral uh, reaction to it. But I do have that. And, you know, I'm willing to defend that that is not the right thing to do to just indiscriminately murder people. So, so, you don't really know where your morality is derived from. Basically, just social constructs. Yeah, I mean that's where it's derived from. That's where your morality is. <laughs> yeah, okay. I mean I think that's technically where all of our morality is. You can write it down in a book. I mean, and there's obviously there's plenty of books on morality, uh, whether it's from the Bible or not. But ultimately, I think they all just come like the 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 ought statements, what one ought to do and what one ought not to do, ultimately just come down to the habits that we learn from society and tradition and then we can reflect on those on our own and again there's lots of things that were taught in the bible that i think are morally abhorrent so do you think yeah. there's such thing as objective morality no 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 I, I i don't i don't think there's some morality like hidden out there in nature i mean look this is something that's called like the is ought distinction yeah. is statements or descriptive statements are not the same as ought statements so there's something called the naturalistic fallacy where just because you something is natural you assume that it is moral it's a fallacy like cancer is natural i don't think most of us would think that it ought to occur you know so I so i mean that's the distinction between is statements like actual natural things and then ought statements, which, I mean, yes, they're subjective. Uh, they're subjective in the way that there's not like this uh, eternal, essentializing, foundationalizing. And again, just with murder, there are legitimate reasons that you can unalive somebody. Mm-hmm. Like, like, there are legitimate reasons to do that, even within the Bible. The Bible has all sorts of exceptions on, on when you're allowed to do that. Yeah. So there's always nuance and context involved. Do I, I mean... Obviously, I don't think nature has a specific rule somewhere hidden that says don't murder. I mean, go go try out and go into the woods and come into a tiger and say, oh, no, I'm a human. I have a natural right not to be killed and see what the tiger says. The tiger doesn't care. The tiger's going to eat you. I mean, if yeah. it thinks you're t- maybe it'll bite you and not think you're very tasty. I don't know. 
Yeah. So well, at least you didn't misgender me. So. Not yet. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> Go for it. Every time you reference me, you have my full permission to call me a she. Okay. I don't care. All right. I don't care. I, I've identified it as, as a woman when it's convenient. Reproductive rights. This health care, women's uh, rights for health care. And hey, you're a man, so I don't think any man has any right. I actually identify as a woman. Okay, great. Wonderful. Awesome. Thank you very much. Yeah. Me, so. I mean, if you identified as a woman to me, I probably wouldn't believe you. Yeah. Well, yeah. I identify as a woman. I, I don't believe uh, you. Well, that's perfectly fine. You're yeah. just a transphobe. Um, well, no. I mean, you want to know why? Why? Because you don't appear to have any secondary female sex characteristics. You don't appear feminine in any way. I don't have an Adam's apple. Um, I don't have a profound Adam's apple. I've always okay. been very so that, 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 about that's it. One, I've always that's been one male sex character. I've been very self-conscious about yeah, my you, entire you don't life. Appear you just to, had to basically in, tangentially bring it up like that. Yeah, so you don't, you don't appear to be you know, feminine in any way. You don't go by any feminine linguistics. And also, you know, I've heard the words that come out of your mouth. So that's why, <laughs> that's why I would be skeptical if you just came up and said that to me. So, but that's how I base that on I mean, no, if I someone understand. tells me that, I'm like, okay. Well, mm -hmm. <laughs> when it came to Riley Gaines, I knew I was going to agree with her on almost everything that she'd said. Uh, but I even tried, I asked a question of uh, regarding the biological advantages of Leah Thomas. And, and I asked, well, some people claim, well, she came, or well, uh, Leah Thomas had come in fifth, as, and you also came in fifth. Um, if there is such a biological advantage, why did he come in fifth? Unfair. Uh, but one thing I do want to ask, because you mentioned the biological advantage earlier. There are there are some out there that I've seen that say, well, well, Leah Thomas came in fifth. She came in fifth. So how could how, how could she have a biological advantage? She didn't even win. What would you have to say to people that say things like that? If there is such a biological advantage, why did he come in fifth? She came in eighth, fifth, and first in different races. Yeah, first in others, multiple firsts. It was no, she had, she had one first at that specific race. Well, it, and well, it was nine seconds behind. Yeah, the world but record. there was other. There had been ones before. I mean, yeah, I'm sure there had been other were, races, but the main Riley thing was just nine. Riley brought up right. a lot more of a record. Yeah. Um, and so and so that that's my point. It, it's and, just, and, I, I do I do try yeah. to ask questions even if uh, from she, another perspective. And, and saying, she gave her feelings that that um. Oh, it, it's clear to me based on my feelings well, that, that the they evidence. throw. But I can wholeheartedly say that Thomas didn't try. This was all part of a bigger picture. Thomas dives in and literally looks like he doesn't know how to swim. Places eighth. This was a this was sending a message that trans women can compete with women and win, but not always dominate. So, um, so do, you, do you think? So you so you kind of saying that maybe, and obviously it's not confirmed that Leah kind of threw the race a little bit and and waited Absolutely. yeah yeah we were well, the evidence was is that she came in eighth fifth and first that's that she did she she did really good in one race she tied with riley riley got the exact same score as, as she did and then and then four other cis women uh beat both blew them both out of the water and then she came in eighth and another one which means seven other cis women blew her out of the water so i mean that's the actual empirical evidence Riley had a feeling that, oh, well, she must have been throwing the race because that, you know, that's as if Leah Thomas winning that one race didn't get her like tons of hate as if it would have been that much bigger had she won another race. So that was the end of our Alphabet Wars debate. Um, I thought it was a pretty good debate. I enjoyed having it with Kev. Hopefully he enjoyed having it with me. Uh, I'd be more than happy to have uh, more debates along those lines with him. Um, we didn't get to all the topics that we had originally wanted to talk about. We barely discussed gender at all. Um, you probably noticed I kept trying when we were discussing about biological sex, he kept trying to add in about, you know, guys wearing dresses or cosplaying and all that stuff has to do with gender. And I was just sticking on the topic as we were supposed to, but there were lots of other issues, um, that we didn't really get a chance to get to, and maybe we can get to it another time. But uh, let me know what your thoughts were. Who won the Alphabet Wars? Let me know in the comments. Was it me? Was it Kev? And like and subscribe if you want to see more debates like this. Thank you so much for turning into Agitation Rising, your source for local, leftist, independent journalism in Central Illinois and beyond. You can always find our articles on our blog, link in the description. Please like, subscribe, and comment. Agitation Rising is under the Strange Corners of Thought umbrella, so feel free to contribute directly to our Patreon, or donate via PayPal or Cash App. Again, links in the description. Keep agitating, keep rising, and we'll see you on the other side. Thanks.